This video will walk through the 2022 NFHS football rule changes. By watching this video, it does not absolve you from attending any required state or local rules association sessions that are required for you to keep your active football card. In addition to going over the rule changes, we will supplement this video with actual plays from games to help describe the rules that are changing. This is a list of the rule changes. We'll go through them in more detail later on on the slides, but uh, to go through them, the first rule change is that the team box may be extended by state, state association adoption. That is specific to each state. So please see your state, which you work currently work in, and they are adhering to this rule. The next rule is to clarify that the game ball may be changed between bounds by any game official. Previously, only the referee could remove a game ball if it did not meet the requirements of the rule book. Now the allowance is that any official if he or she determines that a game ball is either not pumped up enough to the requirements or if it uh, does not meet it in any other way, according to the rule book, they have the authority to remove it from the game. The next rule change is uh, to talk about the numeral zero is now a legal number, not double zero, but only single zero. The next one talks about, it re redefines the area of the chop block, which talks about a high block above the waist and a low block below the waist. And you will see the underlined ones in this presentation are the ones we will show video on later on in this presentation. The next rule talks about the change the offended team clock options. This one allows the offended team under two minutes of the first half or under two minutes in the game to have the option to start the game clock on the snap. The next rule allows an exception to the play clock administration, meaning if certain things happen to the defense, such as, and not fully including all things, a helmet off, an injury, a removal for player for blood or uniform violations, the play clock would then be set to 40 seconds instead of 25 due to an administrative stoppage. And the final rule change is it allows an exception for the passer to legally throw the ball away to conserve yardage. The passer now who is outside the free blocking zone is allowed to throw the ball away legally as long as the, the passer at one time was outside the free blocking zone and the ball reaches the line of scrimmage, whether in bounds or the line of scrimmage out of bounds, since the line of scrimmage extends out of bounds. The first one we're going to look at today is the chop block. In Rule 248, a chop block is a combination block by two or more teammates against an opponent other than the runner, with or without delay, where one of the blocks is below the waist and one of the blocks is above the waist. Next, you'll see some videos and we will discuss scenarios where we see a chop block and it is a foul and those that are not a chop block. In this first play, we're gonna look at the action by the right guard in the center here. And remember, the rule change tells us that there has to be a block above the waist and a block below the waist. So in this, in this situation, you will see that the center goes low on the nose guard, below the waist, and the, and the right guard comes across with a high portion of the block. So in that situation, we would have a foul for a chop block because of the, both of the components meet the requirements of the new rule change. In this next video, we're going to take a look at the action by, the, by mainly the right guard here, okay? So the action by the right guard right off the snap is the block is at the waist right here. So that does not meet the requirements of the of a component for a low portion of the block. Therefore, if number 54, the center, comes over and 
adds a high portion of the block, we do not have a chop block in this situation because the initial contact by the defender, I'm sorry, by the offensive lineman is at the waist. So this is a situation where there is not a foul for a chop block because of the, the low component is at the waist. This next play, we are going to take a look at the action by the guard, the guard, right guard here and the right tackle right here. So we play the play and you can see right away that the right guard goes low below the waist and the tackle comes across and then there's a potential for a high block here. So we have low, high component. I know it's not much, but in those situations when we're dealing with safety fouls, though we are going to, to work to the letter of the law on the chop block, and that would be a situation where there's a, a chop block and it should be called. Our last play we look at, we're going to look at the right tackle and the right tight end here. So here's a situation where the right tight tackle goes low, but is there contact? If there is contact, there is enough, that would be enough for the low block because it is below the waist and the then the tight end comes high and pushes down. But in this case, this is a good job for not calling a chop block because the low component, there is no contact, but there is a high portion of the component. The next rule change has to do with the play clock. Rule 631 states 25 seconds will be on the play clock and start on the ready for play signal prior to a try following a score to start a period or overtime series, following administration of an inadvertent whistle, following a charge timeout, following an official's timeout in 357 or 3510. The exceptions are listed below, and they are only exceptions if they are related to a defensive player. Those exceptions include but are not limited to a defensive penalty, a defensive injury, sending a defender out for concussion symptoms or blood, and a defensive helmet coming off. If any of those exceptions happen during the play, then we set the play clock to 40 seconds. Here are two plays which illustrate when the play clock should be set to 40 seconds. So in here we have the referee winding the clock, and we have a dead ball defensive offside. So after the administration of this penalty, the play clock should be set to 40 seconds. The next play we're going to look at is another defensive penalty where we have an obvious face mask and flags on the play. After the uh, administration of the penalty for the 15 yard face mask, the play clock shall be set to 40 seconds. This also includes if a helmet comes off, an injury to the defense, we send someone off for blood uniform violations or concussion-like symptoms. This next rule change is going to cause us to do a lot more thinking, especially under two minutes of the half and the game as it pertains to the play, as, excuse me, as it pertains to the game clock. When a foul is committed by either team, with less than two minutes in the game remaining in either half, the offended team will have the option to start the game clock on the snap. What this means is whether the team are, is ahead or behind in the score is irre irrelevant to this rule. It's the offended team. So if the offended team means if we have a false start with the game clock running, the defense has the choice to start the next play on the snap. If we have a face mask by the defense and the runner was tackled inbounds, 
the offense then has the opportunity to choose whether the game clock starts on the snap or not. For these next set of plays, we are to assume that the game clock is under two minutes and we either, either in the second quarter or the fourth quarter when we are looking at these situations here. Okay, we saw this play earlier. The referee is winding the game clock, so it is running. We have a foul for a defensive offside. So how should we handle this situation? Well, first, the line of scrimmage official should run in killing the clock, throwing his or her flag, and giving a preliminary signal to the, refer to the referee. Then, since the offense is the offended team, the line of scrimmage official at the top of the screen, either the, the head linesman or the side judge, should immediately go and talk to the coach and ask them whether or not they would like the game clock to start on the snap. Because if they do not, if, if they do not make that decision, we are going to start the game clock on the ready for play. So this is very crucial in crew communication that we all have to be on the same page because we do not want the referee to go and not and announce the foul and then wind the clock without talking to the offended team's coach. This next play is a similar one. We have a face mask with the runner stopped inbound short of the line to gain or even beyond the line to gain because regular penalty administration would tell us that the play clock, the game clock would continue to run. However, since the foul was on the defense, now the offense has the decision whether or not to start the game clock on the snap. This next play, we will see a roughing the passer called, and the pass is completed downfield. Even though the team made the line to gain, regular penalty administration would tell us that the game clock will start on the ready for play. However, we must go to the offensive team, which means the head linesman or side judge at the top of the screen needs to go and talk to the head coach and ask them if they would like the game clock to start on the snap. If not, it'll start on the ready for play signal. And in this situation, going back to our previous rule, the game, the play clock would be set to 40 because we have a defensive penalty on this play and the previous play with the face mask on the defense. This next play, we have an obvious foul that is a live ball foul with an illegal shift. So this live ball foul with an incomplete pass would, would start on the snap. However, the play clock would be set to 25 here, okay? If this pass was completed and short of the end, of short of the end zone and the runner was tackled at the one yard line, we would administer the penalty and ask the defense, would they like the, the game clock to start on the snap? We cannot assume that they want the game clock to start on the snap. They may want it to start on the ready for play. Don't make assumptions for coaches in situations like this. This next play, we have a hold by the offense. Right here, which is a quality holding call. And the quarterback gains a few yards and is tackled in bounds short of the line of the game. So we would go to the defense and ask them, would they like the game clock to start on the snap? If not, it'll start on the ready for play and the play clock will be set to 25. 
The final new rule deals with intentional grounding. It is legal for a player to conserve yardage by intentionally throwing an incomplete forward pass if the passer has been beyond the lateral boundary of the free blocking zone as established at the snap and the pass reaches the neutral zone, including the extension beyond the sideline. So there are a few key words that we must look at in looking at this new rule. The passer has been beyond the lateral boundary. If the passer goes outside the lateral boundary of the free blocking zone and returns back inside, the passer was out and is always out. So at that point, the quarterback would just need to get the ball to the line of scrimmage. In addition, if the pass reaches the neutral zone, including an extension beyond the sideline. An example of this is if the If the line of scrimmage is the 20 yard line going out and the quarterback throws is outside the free blocking zone, throws a pass which crosses the, the boundary line on the sideline at the 18 yard line, continues to fly and hits something out of bounds at the 22 yard line out of bounds, it is still deemed to cross the line of scrimmage at that point as it pertains to intentional grounding. All right, these next few plays pertain to intentional grounding. So when, when we look at this and our referees, our initial alignments should put us in a position where we understand where the free blocking zone every, is every time. Our alignment should be at a depth of 14 yards and just outside where the tight end would be. And that's because where the tight end is, is where the free blocking zone line exists. And the way we officiate this is if a quarterback takes three steps laterally, it is assumed that the quarterback is out at or beyond the free blocking zone boundary and then is afforded the opportunity to throw to legally throw the ball away since they are outside the free blocking zone and if they make the line of scrimmage. So whenever you feel that there is pressure on the quarterback and the quarterback releases the ball, you should run up to that spot and hold that spot. If you, if you do not remember where the ball is snapped, that is where we come together as a crew where the, the referee would run, and I'll illustrate that with this play. So right here, the, the quarterback takes one, two, three steps laterally. The quarterback is outside of the free blocking zone. Because if we look at it, the free blocking zone would extend just outside the hashes here, and the line of scrimmage is the 20-yard line. So the quarterback is outside the free blocking zone right here. So now the quarterback only needs to get the ball to the line of scrimmage or as the previous rule will had it, have a receiver who is an eligible receiver in the vicinity where the ball is thrown. So right here, the quarterback throws the ball and this is a perfect example of the extension of the boundary. So the ball crossed the line of scrimmage behind the 20, but it landed beyond the 20. So in this situation, the quarterback has legally thrown the ball away and there is no foul for intentional grounding here. So this is where the line of scrimmage official at the bottom of the screen needs to communicate to the referee that the ball has crossed the line of scrimmage because that is the information that he or she knows at that point then the referee will make the determination whether or not the quarterback is outside the free blocking zone so the at this point where the the court the referee should be coming up to here to mark where the quarterback threw the ball if you recall where your markers are for the free blocking zone then you know that the quarterback was outside the free blocking zone if you forget, you stand in that position and you ask the umpire where the ball was thrown from. In this case, I'm sorry, where the ball was snapped from. In this case, 
I'm sorry, it was snapped from the 20. Um, it was the hash. So you have to make a determination, and we want to err on the side of the quarterback being outside the free blocking zone because the way the rule and the way the the rule change came to be was the they were the offense is giving up a down without having an unnecessary hit on the quarterback. So we are not going to be technical when it comes to uh whether or not the person was inside or outside the free blocking zone here. So once court so we'll look at another play here. So again, we are snapping from around the um looks like around the 23 yard line and the ball is snapped at the hash so the one thing you can notice is the referee is not in optimal position here because he is behind the quarter quarterback we need to be get our width to get that free blocking zone so in this case the free blocking zone would be again just outside the hash and about the post area of the uh of the goal post so the quarterback is still in still inside the free blocking zone and throws the ball away does it make the line of scrimmage where again what does if it makes the line if it's close it's within a half a yard of the line of scrimmage we're not going to be too uber technical but what this line of scrimmage fisher should see here is the ball falling incomplete doing a scan of the area understanding the ball at this point hit about the 23 yard line which is at the line of scrimmage so this line the line of scrimmage official should work his or her way into the referee and make the comment the ball made the line of scrimmage however there were no receive eligible receivers in the area then it's the referee's decision to determine by running over here was the quarterback or was the quarterback ever outside the free blocking zone in this situation since the ball was snapped at the hash the referee will determine that the quarterback never got outside the free blocking zone therefore the requirements for intentional grounding or the requirements to legally ground the ball include throwing it in an area where an eligible receiver is since the line of scrimmage official told the referee that there was no receiver in the area at that point you would drop a flag for intentional grounding in this next play again we're snapping from the hash free blocking zone extends out to here and probably close to the post slash middle of the field but again we're looking for those three steps lateral by the quarterback in any situation so here it is we get the we get that three steps lateral and let's look where the quarterback releases the ball it releases the ball just outside the hash which when we go back to our where our free blocking zone is it's really close to just outside the hash right so in this situation one two three throwing the ball it obviously crosses the line of scrimmage so this is where the the referee has to make a decision and throwing the ball from here in this situation i would hope the referee would make the decision that the quarterback was outside the free blocking zone at this point and determine that the quarterback legally grounded the ball and i made a mistake in my first assessment where the ball was snapped it snapped from just inside the hash so just outside the hash would get you outside the free blocking zone. One, two, three, throwing the ball away across the line of scrimmage. So line of scrimmage official, you would run to the referee and said and say, there was no eligible receivers in the area. However, the pass crossed the line of scrimmage. And then the referee would run to the, would already be at the spot where the quarterback threw the ball and determine that the passer was outside the free blocking zone or ask the umpire where they spotted the ball so then they can do their assessment and determine that there is no foul for intentional grounding due to the fact that the passer was outside the free blocking zone 
and threw the ball beyond the line of scrimmage. I hope everyone who watched this video found it useful and the plays illustrated the rule changes. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the comment section. And I thank you for viewing them and best of luck in this upcoming season.